Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight in celebrating the launch of the Marine Mammal Atlas of Amman. Uh, it's so lovely to see where everybody is logging in from, and it's uh, lovely to see that we have a wide distribution of attendees today. Uh, this full color photographic reference book is the culmination of over 20 years of scientific research um, providing a thorough geographical representation of the Arabian whales and dolphins that call the Northern Indian Ocean their home. This is an important resource which contributes to our understanding of Oman's unique marine and coastal wildlife. We're very excited to be sharing this publication with you and hope to see it widely used by students, researchers and decision makers. During tonight's panel discussion, some of the individuals who contributed to the making of the Atlas will share their knowledge and experiences with us. We will learn about the different species of cetaceans that can be found in Oman, what the research conducted over the last 20 years has taught us, and hear from the panelists some of their own personal stories from having been engaged in the work for so many years now. Before we begin tonight, however, I must take the opportunity to recognize the support that the team have received from Renaissance Services who have supported and funded us in this research since 2011. Their long-term commitment to this program has enabled us to sustain our research and allowed us to deliver informed conservation actions with local communities. Um, just a second. Yeah, it, it, sorry, I just lost my notes for a second. Uh, so yes, I, I just wanted to thank um, Renaissance uh, Services and, um, you know, just to mention that um, at ESO, we rely on corporate support to deliver all of our programs, and we wanted to express our gratitude to Renaissance for their support. Uh, we also have to thank many other organizations who have supported the development of the Atlas, including Five Oceans Environmental Services, as well as government entities such as the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Fisheries, Wealth and Water Resources, the Environment Authority, as well as the Natural History Museum. But in addition to these, there are several other international research partners that have um, supported the program since inception, whether it's through the support of data analysis, cataloging, supporting the scientific research, and assisting in securing ongoing funding. So to all of you, a big thank you. Uh, um, we only have five panelists and one speaker today, but it's also important for us to send a big thank you to the much broader team of um, researchers and volunteers beyond our panel members who have been involved in the data collection over the years. Of course, I fear to miss out on some names, but would like to mention a few names such as Louisa Panampalam, who collected so much research uh, and data off of Muscat, Howard Gray, who collected important genetic samples, Daryl McDonald, who continues to support ESO field research, Fred Christensen, Ken Finley, as well as many others who have contributed over the years. In addition to that, the Environment Authority have always been supportive through the years and a special thanks to their specialists as well as their rangers. So for today, we have one speaker and five panelists, and I will take a few moments to introduce them individually. Our presenter for today is Edith Shum. Edith is a, uh, a GIS environmental consultant at Five Oceans with a background in social and ecological sciences. Welcome, Edith. And our first um, panelist is Robert Baldwin, who works with Five Oceans Environmental Services. He is in the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group and Marine Turtle Specialist Group, as well as having a seat on the CMS Scientific Council the International Whaling Commission Scientific Committee and the Convention of Migratory Species IOC Turtle MOU Expert Advisory Committee, in addition to several other scientific committees. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Suad. Great, great to see so many familiar names as well as a lot of unfamiliar names. I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. Uh, the second panelist today is Dr. Gianna Minton, who is a consultant at, at Megaptera Marine Conservation and deputy chair of the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group. Gianna has a PhD focusing on the unique non-migratory Arabian Sea humpback whales. Welcome, Gianna.
And our third panelist is Tim Collins. Uh, Tim directs the cetacean research efforts of the Wildlife Conservation Society in Africa, particularly in the Gulf of Guinea and the Western Indian Ocean. He is the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group Africa Coordinator and a National Geographic Explorer. His current focus is the development and implementation of, fo of projects focusing on the impact of underwater noise and shipping on cetaceans in the Western Indian Ocean and the further expansion of conservation actions for critically endangered Atlantic humpback dolphin. Welcome, Tim, otherwise known as Moth. <laughs> Hi, Sarah, thank you for that. Uh, Andrew Wilson, Dr. Andrew Wilson is the founding director of Future Sea He's a conservation and environmental sciences focused company. He is a member of the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group, participant at IWC Scientific Committee meetings, and holds a PhD in biological sciences from studying uh, the spatial ecology of Arabian sea humpback whales from the University of Exeter in the UK. Welcome, Andy. Good evening. Nice to see you, and thanks. Uh, lovely to see so many faces here tonight. And last but not least, we have Aida El Jabari. Uh, she is a marine environmental specialist working with the Environment Authority and has a master's of flood and coastal engineering from Brunel University, London, as well as a bachelor of marine and fisheries science from SQU. She served as a lead government official developing protocols for implementation of a countrywide marine mammal and turtle stranding network. We look forward to hearing much more about um, your program later today, Aida. Welcome. Thank you, Sad. Thank you. So it's my honor to be joined this evening by the dedicated scientists who spent hours studying and conducting research on cetaceans in Amman. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will begin today with Edith's presentation. Uh, she will give us a short overview about the objectives of the atlas and the content included and how to use the information. Uh, please go ahead, um, Edith, you can share your screen. Thanks, Suad. Um, can everyone see my screen? Looks clear on my end. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All right, thank you. So Suad said, yep. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Edith and I work with Five Oceans as a GIS environmental consultant and I've been involved with this project with ESO for over a year and a half now and my role for this project was largely focused on the visual aspects, so the design and layout of the atlas where we really wanted to prioritize making this a visual experience complemented with really good informative information. So I'm really excited to finally share the Marine Mammal Atlas of Amman for everyone to enjoy. So before we break down the atlas, I just wanted to take some time to highlight the value and the story behind the creation of the atlas. So if these will work. <laughs> There you go. So Oman, as we know it, it's uh, truly a unique part of the world with powerful seasonal upwellings that helps source an abundance of nutrients for even the largest of species. And over the past 20 years or so, it's become increasingly more aware that Oman is home to a country of substantial group of rich marine mammals. However, even after many decades of research, we recognized a gap in the field, a visual tool that is easily digestible for a range of different users to comprehend the importance of the marine mammals found in this region. So to really bridge this knowledge gap between all these stakeholders and all these individuals, we really wanted to create the most comprehensive collection of information to conserve and to protect the rich cetacean biodiversity of Oman and also provide information to help plan for effective conservation and sustainable use. So this current edition of the Atlas is derived from data from 1961 to 2017, using both dedicated scientific field surveys and reports from third parties. And as an e-Atlas, this really opens up the opportunity for us to update the data, uh, update the Atlas as more data is collected. And this allows users like me and you to really have this valuable source of collective data to always come back to when necessary. So this atlas is comprised of 197 pages and it is divided into five main chapters, um, beginning with chapter one, species accounts, chapter two, area assessment, area accounts, chapter three, threats to cetaceans, 
chapter four, threat specific mitigation measures, and lastly, chapter five, organization and conservation frameworks. So all of this is further broken down into the table of contents that you see here. And in this presentation, we're just gonna highlight the key features of each chapter just to give you an idea. So just note that as an e-atlas, um, each chapter um, was is designed to be viewed on its own and it's not meant to be really be read from front to back. So to begin with, the introduction um, is divided into two parts, beginning with physical oceanographic features. And the second part um, focuses on the study methods and strategy employed. So some highlights from this chapter include oceanographic features. It includes a detailed map of sea surface temperature and net primary productivity throughout the year. There's also seafloor geomorphology, survey approach and methods, and some detailed maps illustrating the biodiversity of cetacean distribution in Oman waters. So that's the introduction, um, but moving on to the bulk of the atlas, which is chapter one, um, species accounts, where we introduce the 20 species of marine mammals found in Oman's waters. And here, each species is dedicated a full page spread and it's divided into 10 main sections as illustrated here. And here as an e-atlas, we really want to, we have this advantage of encouraging users to zoom in and out to view the page in greater detail. And this is especially useful for maps to the right where you can zoom in and look at the points and look at the legend clearly. And this atlas also has interactive elements such as that threat symbol at the top where you can click and it brings you to a page in the, in the third chapter. There's also references throughout the text where each chapter is dedicated a full list of uh, references. So that's chapter one. And moving on to chapter two, we introduce the uh, area assessments. And this highlights the seven regions of Oman. And second section highlights the area counts. So the important marine mammals areas uh, identified by um, IUCN and the Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force. So beginning with section one in area assessment, you can see here, we emphasize the regions of Oman and this is separated into six main sections. Section two um, introduces the important marine mammal areas and we have identified four. Um, by the IUCN and the Marine Mammal Area Task Force. And each of these um, areas is divided into five main parts as shown here. Moving on to chapter three, where we illustrate the threats relevant and documented for cetaceans in Oman. And we divide this chapter into nine main threats, which include ship strike, underwater noise, offshore oil and gas, whale and dolphin watching, pollution, coastal development, climate change, biotoxins and disease, and lastly, fishery threats, bycatch and overfishing. So some highlights from this chapter include a documented threats table specific to the 20 marine mammals reported in Oman, and also things like detailed case studies from different parts of the world to gain insight from. So to follow up on the identified threats from chapter three, chapter four dives a little deeper on ways we can mitigate some of these threats described. So this chapter is divided into four main sections, which include mitigation strategies for ship strike, for underwater noise, for fisheries, and for whale and dolphin watching. So some of the highlights from this chapter include the Oman specific mitigation strategies, such as the adoption of the whale management program by the Port of Dukham and illustrated blueprints for achieving sustainable practices. And last but not least, we have chapter five, which highlights the organization and conservation frameworks. And this is broken down to two sections as well. So beginning with a detailed review of the eight multilateral organizations, we have um, IUCN, the International Whaling Commission, CMS, CITES, IMO, FAO and the Arabian Sea Whale Network. So some pages from this, this section include the IWC mitigation measures and stages for the Arabian Sea humpback whale, and also current policies issued by scientific committees. And last but not least, we have the regional involvements. 
So specifically from the Oman Natural History Museum, um, from ESO, from Five Oceans, and the um, Environment Authority, and lastly, the Ministry of Agricultural Fisheries and Water Resources. So a lot of these pages highlight um, the history and the ongoing projects with clickable links, and also showcases the importance of working together as a community. And that brings us to the end of the atlas, a very quick overview. But just wanted to take some time to mention that this atlas, creation of this atlas wouldn't have been possible without the dedicated teams behind Renaissance or ESO and the support of the Oman Natural History Museum, Environment Authority, and the Ministry of Agricultural Fisheries and Water Resources. They've always enthusiastically put in the effort to share, to manage, and to process, and to really commit to the value that we all see in Oman. And for instance, uh, thanks to Renaissance, we've been able to implement advanced monitoring techniques, including satellite tracking and drone surveys and DNA sampling. And with ESO and support from the IUCN, we were able to establish uh, the Oman Cetacean Database, which is now populated by many Omanis and volunteers from like all around the world. But it doesn't just stop there. There are many individuals from many organizations and people beyond the ones that are just listed here that have been involved over the decades of data collected. And so on behalf of Five Oceans, um, we really want to thank everyone who has played their part in creating the Atlas. And we really look forward to using this collective tool as a means to continue studying and monitoring Oman's whales and dolphins in this valuable and really unique region of the world. So thank you. Thank you, Edith. That's a great quick presentation and um, I hope that everyone takes the time to view the full document which is av available on our website. Uh, we will now move on to the panelists, uh, starting with Rob, but I would uh, first like to remind all our panelists to uh, stick with the five minute allocation that we've given you. I know you have a lot to share, uh, but hopefully we'll have more time um, during the Q&A. For our audience, I uh, want to remind you that you can start putting in any comments or questions that you have in the chat section and we'll get to them towards the end of the um, session. So Rob, uh, you've been involved with whale and dolphin research in Oman from around the mid 90s. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what sparked your interest to begin with, to get involved in this research and how the research has evolved over the years starting uh, from the mid 90s to where we are today. Yeah, thanks, Surad. Um, actually, my very first experience was, was even longer ago than that, actually in, um, in September of 1988, uh, would you believe, giving my age away a little bit here, but um, it was uh, during Oman's Coastal Zone Management Program, and um, I was fortunate enough to, um, to be part of that as a volunteer. And one of the things uh, that, that sort of sparked my interest on this was uh, very early on, uh, during some of the field work we were doing there, a, a small group of bottlenose dolphins uh, which we now know as Tersiopsiduncus, um, but in those days we didn't even have a species name for this particular species, um, was swimming very close to shore and we were able to get in and, and um, you know, and share that experience with them. And, you know, it's, it's something which I haven't done very much uh, more recently because, you know, swimming with, with animals has proven not to be, you know, quite the right thing to do. But um, in those days, uh, you know, mom was, um, was quite an open place with relatively few people and lots of remote coastline and just experiences like that being able to to really enjoy Oman's wilderness um, and you know it, it still it still has such a sense of wilderness Oman it's a wonderful country in that in that regard and it just brings you very close to to nature and to wildlife and um, there was a there was a real gap in our understanding and our knowledge of of whales and dolphins um, not just of Oman, but anywhere in the North, Northern Indian Ocean. Um, and even today, there are relatively few groups studying it. So it's great that this team has been able to, to study it so thoroughly and, and in such detail over the years. Um, and really, you know, a big, a big round of applause for all those people that have been involved. It's been, it's been a tremendous team effort uh, with so many people. And you, you saw it on Edith's presentation, so many people from so many parts of the world uh, joining in, um, individuals and organizations, and 
you know, part of the reason for that is just the uniqueness uh, of this part of the world, this, this little cul-de-sac of the Indian Ocean, um, where we have this remarkable range of marine mammals, and some of which, as, as people or other people on this presentation right now, the likes of Andy and Gianna and, and so on, you know, who focus their PhD studies on, on these species have revealed, you know, just, just how unique this part of the world is with, with subspecies, maybe even species unique to science, um, you know, genetically isolated uh, animals, which are, you know, truly Arabian, or at least truly Northwestern Indian Ocean uh, animals. And, you know, who, who could not get interested in that? So <laughs> absolutely, you know, it's been, it, it's something which has been very easy interest to get into. And, you know, working amongst a wonderful group of people who, who share that passion and who brought a lot of science to the table. I mean, myself, like I think all of us actually, um, you know, have been largely self-taught at first and then gradually benefited from the expertise of people elsewhere in the world who'd done all this before in other parts and then brought that expertise very generously into Oman and to the table. And we were able to gradually build the knowledge um, that we built uh, over the years. So, you know, it's really been a fantastic journey and, and we've got a long way to go still. We've got so much more to find out. We're just, we're just really the tip of the iceberg in spite of what you see a beautiful atlas. And, you know, thanks to Edith for really bringing all that information alive in such a visually vibrant way. Uh, but but still, we're, we're a long way from understanding everything that we really need to understand if we're going to be able to um, you know, protect and manage uh, Oman's uh, marine mammals and Oman's marine life generally um, you know, effectively, because obviously we, we live in, a, in an era and in a region where um, you know, there's a real pressure for, for development and, and and for people's prosperity, and that sometimes comes at the expense of the environment. And, and you know, so we're still a long way to to go to, to find out basic information that we need to to make sure that that development can go hand in hand with the protection of of the marine environment, upon which a lot of it depends. Um, so it's not just a passion, but it's also you know an essential cause. And you know that that really drives. I think it's really driven all of us over the years. You know, how do how do we keep ahead of that curve? How do we keep the information coming in so that we can better um, promote the awareness and promote the kind of solutions uh, that we need to to help protect all these animals into the future? I won't take up too much time. I know we're, we're pushed for it, and, and other people will have uh, a lot to say as well. Uh, but thank you very much for for including me. And yeah, again, great to see so many. So many uh, well-known faces, as well as and names, as well as um, you know, some people that I, I don't yet know on on the uh, call today. Thank you, Rob. Um, we will move on to Gianna, and Gianna, you also uh, spent um, quite a bit of time in in Oman in the early days. Perhaps you can tell us also a little bit about your personal experience here, and then move on to uh, a discussion on how. The, what the significance is of a local research study that over the years has developed into international uh, as well as regional partnerships and agreements and collaborations over the years. Thanks, so, Saad. Um, so I lived in Oman between 1997 and 2005, eight and a half years. Uh, and I first started uh, cetacean work working as a guide on dolphin watching tours in 1999. And that was just so inspiring. Um, and by meeting Rob and other people, I learned about some of the really intriguing research questions that were out there, all there was to learn about whales and dolphins in Oman. And um, a lot of us on this call started to work together to try and do some uh, structured systematic research for the first time in Oman. The real challenge at that time in um, the early 2000s was that we had no actual financial support for our work. Um, but we had something really important, which was the blessing of the Ministry of Environment, as it was called at the time. And we had a lot of in-kind support from all kinds of companies and, and individuals um, in Muscat mostly. They provided things like a secondhand boat and fuel and food supplies and transportation and other vital equipment and supplies that we needed for these early um, surveys that we did. And we traced beaches looking for smelly dead whales and dolphins uh, so that we could collect bone and tissue samples. And we spent 
um, weeks living on beaches and, and driving around this battered old boat looking for whales and dolphins. It was a really exciting phase. Um, we were able to individually identify some of the first humpback whales in Oman using a point and shoot camera on this open deck 15 foot long <laughs> boat with only one 25 horsepower engine. Um, and then later after patching up a 20 year old rigid hulled inflatable boat that was donated to our project, we were able to go further offshore we had the first um, live beaked whale sighting in Oman and all kinds of exciting things um, that we were able to document in, in Muscat, the Gulf of Mazira and Dofor, Dofar. It was really rewarding, but it was exhausting. Um, and often the second or third hand donated equipment that we had broke and, and needed repairs that we couldn't really afford. And in the long run, this way of working wasn't really sustainable. Um, it, we couldn't continue to rely on volunteer efforts and in-kind contributions. So as I was leaving Muscat in 2005, we were on the cusp of this whole new um, era, which was uh, possible after the foundation of the Environment Society of Oman. Um, and when I returned to Oman for field work at various stages in 2011, 2019, 2021, it was really exciting to see how each time I came back, um, the work was really evolving and progressing thanks to ESO's ability to engage in sort of a, a whole new level of fundraising, um, the amazing support that was made available by organizations like uh, Renaissance and the International Whaling Commission, um, and this framework of the ESO and Five Oceans and now Future Seas and, and the collaborations that took place with, with experts from all over the world has really allowed the research to, to enter into a whole new era with um, cutting edge technology and methodologies. And Andy's gonna be able to, to talk to you about that a little bit more. Um, what's also been really exciting to see is how, uh, as Rob just um, talked about this work that um, initially started in Oman, has been able to sort of inspire and uh, catalyze work further afield in the Arabian Sea. Um, so as Rob said, really the whole Northern Indian Ocean is, is interesting for cetaceans and really particularly interesting for what we know now is a non-migratory population of, of humpback whales in the Arabian Sea. Um, and in 2015, we formed the Arabian Sea Whale Network. And that network has grown to include almost 70 scientists and conservation organizations from the region um, with support from, from other um, experts around the world. And the Arabian Sea Whale Network is working with the International Whaling Commission and the Convention on Migratory Species to develop a regional conservation management plan. And this conservation management plan is really needed, as Rob said, to bring on board um, governments and other stakeholders to really collaborate to protect this non-migratory population of whales and, and other whale species. Um, and it will build on an existing concerted action that was approved by the CMS in 2017. So there's um, so much going on. It's been really, really rewarding to see how, how the project has grown over the years. And I'm incredibly grateful to still be part of it. So thank you for, um, for including us all in this wider network. Thank you, Gianna, for continuing to support us despite the fact that you no longer live in Oman. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Tim. And Tim, you've been working on um, humpback whale population recoveries in other parts of the world. And perhaps you can give us a little bit of a ba background on the recovery of humpback whales uh, in other parts of the world globally and what we might expect or um, what might be required here in Oman to see a recovery of humpback whale populations, the Arabian Sea humpback whales. Thank you, um, Tim. Thanks, Sarah. That's uh, um, a loaded question. And uh, yeah, I, well, I prepared some notes. So I thought, because it's quite a, it's quite a um, difficult thing to address. But the, 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 the basic story is that humpback whales around the world are doing great. Um, or they have been doing great, put it that way. They, um, uh, populations in many areas are getting very close, if very close or back at pre-whaling population sizes, uh, particularly in the southern hemisphere and probably the North Pacific too. Um, 
I forget the I forget the absolute numbers, but I, I think the Western and Eastern Australian populations are back up well well above 20, 25,000, uh, potentially higher than that. Um, and same goes for the populations on both coasts of Africa. Um, they're back up 15, 20,000, very likely. Um, and the saving grace for these populations was, uh, it goes back to the global moratorium on whaling. And uh, so the hunting of humpback whales is, black, is banned globally by the IWC, an international agreement. And, um, and it was affected in 1963, but came into full force in uh, 1982. And it stemmed from this growing awareness, both scientific and popular, of the you know, disastrous consequences of whaling, not just for whales, but for ecosystems and oceans and, and uh, even cultures. And the ban on whaling was fought by relatively few. Um, it, was a, it was a heated battle at the IWC, um, but largely driven by sort of competing factions. But the ban itself was contested by relatively few people, everyday people, and is still contested by relatively few people. And one thing is very clear is that that ban, that ban on hunting whales using mechanized means led to this massive resurgence in uh, whale numbers. And this is great, but there's a lesson on that ban and a lesson for all of us as these new threats emerge. So there was essentially no planet for, uh, sorry, there was no, no penalty for any of us in banning humpback whale hunting. There was a few people affected, we didn't go hungry, the whaling industry had been in decline for decades, so there were no major like job losses. However, we removed the major threat to the species and for the most part they rebounded strongly. It was relatively simple, we removed the major threats and they basically did the rest by themselves. You know, we always talk about conserving humpback whales, but the truth is that they just did it themselves. And of course, it's not, nothing's as simple as that, but the gist of it is that we remove their major threat and they recover. And modern oceans now are full of new threats and that many people are unaware of these and, and they're particularly unaware of their scale. And these threats include fisheries that affect every ocean. They include uh, you know, fisheries in deep waters, polar waters. Uh, they include underwater noise, which is largely generated by shipping, but there are other numerous and very important sources of noise, including seismic surveys and military activities. There are a range of pollutants, vast quantities of plastics, chemical pollutants, things like PCBs. And of course, there's climate change, which is already affecting the way humpback whales behave on a large scale in the Southern Ocean. And addressing these threats will require much more than a simple ban that affects relatively few. It will require, of course, management action, including international agreements, but it will require a collective effort by all of us to manage, uh, to manage and modify our own behaviors. Now that's much more complicated. So in Oman, the, the basic truth of the matter is, is that they were doing fine for 70,000 years. And then, you know, there's some variations in population size, uh, you know, linked probably to the uh, monsoon, monsoon strength and the abundance of food. Um, but they were likely never very numerous, but they persisted for this huge period of time until, you know, probably, or there may have been several climate-based shocks, but they basically persisted unaffected until the 60s when they were then hammered in a very short period of time by Soviet whaling fleet. And then they started to recover. So by the time we started working on them, we had estimated, you know, anywhere up to 150 animals in the population, potentially more. We, we hadn't started work in India or anywhere else. And now we have these new threats and the chief threat among those is fisheries. Um, and so pretty much every animal in the Omani population has, uh, has scarring consistent with fisheries entanglement. And the hard truth in Oman is that if in order for this population to recover, we are going to have to address, sort of look these threats in the eye, look these threats in the eye and, um, and deal with them. And there's no easy way to do that. You know, fisheries is a major industry in Oman. Um, shipping is a major industry in Oman. Um, but the hard truth is that we are going to have to make some hard decisions if we're going to protect these animals. Um, I've gone way too long already, so I'll stop there. Sir. Thank you, Tim. Sure, can, um, can I just interject briefly? Um, Tim, there was a question on the chat, which um, was, what is the current trend of the, um, the Arabian Sea humpback whale population? 
Uh, given that you've been coordinating the, the most recent assessment on that, can you give everyone um, a brief uh, summary of, of what the situation is? Yeah, I can. So we've we've uh, we've taken on a different approach to um, this current round of abundance estimation, which is to get a lot of well, not a lot, but we've got some real expert investment in uh, developing abundance estimates and. The sad truth is that, is that all of our independent experts that have looked at the data have concluded that the population is in decline. There may be, uh, we may have half the number of animals that we had when we started working on them in the late 90s, um, which is fairly desperate. And, uh, um, and these, are, you know, these are people that know what they're talking about. Um, we don't have any sort of distinct, you know, um, absolute evidence for what's causing that decline. But as I said, you know, until until we can actually come up with a way to manage the threats that we are um, injecting into the oceans, it will be very, very hard for this population to recover. I will just say one thing to take heart from is that other populations of other species have recovered from incredibly low population sizes, including humpback whales. The humpback whales were reduced to something like, well, less than 5% of their original population size. So, you know, these numbers are fairly scary but there is everything to gain. So I don't want people to think, well, it's all done, dusted, you know, we may as well give up. There's absolutely not my intent. I do think that we need to make some very hard decisions if we're gonna save this population. Thank you, Tim. So certainly there is need for urgent conservation action if we are to try to reverse this declining trend. Um, our next panelist is Andy. Andy, uh, perhaps, you know, you are the, the field monkey, <laughs> if I may call you that, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the realities of working in the field. Uh, you know, is it quite as exciting and glamorous as one might think? Um, but then, you know, returning back to some of uh, what Tim was saying, you know, where is the data taking us and what's the use of this data in informing conservation management? Thanks so much for the introduction. Yes, um, you can call me that. Everyone calls me uh, the field monkey. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, I guess um, if I have to start with the field work, yeah, and the glamorous nature of it, I think we've all seen um, BBC or David Attenborough documentaries where intrepid explorers go off into the wilds and, and go and look for things and you have instant action. It's not really quite the reality of it. Um, Probably it's 49% of the work is in preparation uh, before the survey. 49% um, is probably staring at empty sea. The other guys could probably confirm that for us. Um, and 2% of it is, is, is the action um, where you get to see something. Um, so yeah, I mean, like any job, it, it, some parts of it are not so glamorous. Um, uh, so the extended period of planning at the start usually is begins with like writing proposals um, and, and trying to raise enough money. And if all that's accepted, um, then probably about, uh, you know, a month or so before a survey, then there's a period of writing permits um, where administrative tasks have to take place. Um, and then a couple of weeks before then we really get down to it and we start pulling together all of the equipment because we, we basically take everything from you know, uh, the kitchen sink to a boat workshop with us and then load all of that into a car and a boat and squeeze it all in. And, and, and then we sort of truck along to our selected base camp. Um, sort of the culmination of all that packing is then unpacking it all, of course. Um, and, and then usually by the time you get on the boat uh, to, go and, to go and start searching, start your survey, you're probably quite glad um, to actually be getting down to work um, and, and, and lucky if you stare at empty sea for a few days just to, to relax a bit. But you know, some areas have been fabulously wealthy um, and some not so when we've been on surveys off Oman. We've done thousands of kilometers without seeing anything. And then we've had, immediately we arrive at the site. I remember one year we arrived uh, down in Dofar and we pulled up at the campsite and we had you know, seven humpback whales feeding off our, where our camp was. So, I mean, it, it's, it's very variable. Uh, but generally, by the time you get out on the water and you see something, the adrenaline kind of overrides the, uh, uh, the tiredness and, and, and you get in, into, the, um, into the swing of things. 
Uh, and they're long days on the boat. Uh, usually start just after sunrise and you come in on the boat an, after, an hour after sunset. Um, and it's pretty physically tiring. We stand up on the boat all day. Sitting down is banned um, because generally you fall asleep if you do that. So no one's allowed to sit down. We search standing up and, and that's to get maximum effort um, uh, during those long hot days on the water. And then when we come in in the evening, you know, there's another three, four hours of work of just prepping the boat for the next day and doing data entry. So yeah, there's, there's a fair amount of effort there. And, you know, it was, it was those efforts that we wanted to, 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 to boil down uh, into the Atlas and summarize, you know, 20 years of bouncing around on boats into, uh, into the Atlas. So it's, it's you know, really great to see that, that that's finally um, come out and it's been released. Um, but then I think as, as you know, as Rob, uh, Rob has pointed out um, at the beginning, um, the Atlas tells us much about the gaps um, in what we know as what we actually do know. As you see from some of the maps, there's large areas of sea that have gone unsurveyed. Um, we've only really uh, gone in detail to study a few species and the humpback whales are the ones we've studied the most, spatial ecology and population trends, etc. But the other species we know very little about, um, uh, you know, and, and then also um, our knowledge of, of how these whales are impacted by modern day activities, industrial activities out of sea as, as well are, are very little known. So, and it's like with any, any en environmental issues, you know, those who are working in these specialist subjects um, feel that they're in a race against time um, uh, to ensure the survival, as you know, Tim was saying, for the humpback whales of Oman, we've got to act quickly. Um, and, and those whales are just the sentinel for the other species out there. We don't know what the status is of these other species. So there's so much more work to do. Um, it's been really great to see um, some of this work sort of mushroom a bit, mushroom a bit over throughout the region. Uh, John has explained a little bit about regional efforts and the Ravensea Whale Network, and we can now see counterparts in in India and Pakistan also, um, you know, beginning to make some really interesting findings um, themselves. Um, so, yeah, I think now, I think the, the Atlas helps us to, to visualize what the opportunities are for the future. Um, of course, we need to do a lot, keep on doing the same surveys and build. Um, there's the opportunity of, as well. We're, uh, we're celebrating here 20 years, which means all our hair's falling out. We're starting to wear glasses on the boat. Uh, none of us can read the GPS without our glasses anymore. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this, this, you know, this, now is the time for a new generation to step forward and be trained. Um, the, uh, you know, and we're, we're, we're constantly um, looking at, uh, at using new techniques as, um, as was previously pointed out by Gianna, we've satellite tagging has been fantastic for allowing us to um, to to understand the spatial ecology of whales, which is of course what the atlas is all about. Um, we've also been using other techniques such as moored listening devices or hydrophones on the seabed, which has not just helped us to understand um, the the uh, seasonality of when humpback whales are present off Omar, but we've also detected really cool new things like a new population of blue whales off Oman, and that was reported in the last couple of years. And, and you know, surveys into the future, we hopefully we have one in November, that's dedicated at looking at the, at the health of humpback whales too, using drones. So we fly drones over the top of the whales and we take pictures and we look at the length width relationship. So there's, there's loads of new stuff going on and that information will be making it into the Atlas you know, in time, in the years ahead. Um, particularly, the Atlas is going to allow authorities to work, you know, um, build their marine spatial planning uh, portfolio um, so that they can start using it to, to, uh, to juggle the space use between industry and wildlife. That's very important. There's definitely new, really exciting uh, things happening um, as, uh, as the shipping industry is meeting with um, uh, uh, cetacean scientists to understand what the risk of 
ship strikes and noise out to wells, as, as Tim was pointing out. Um, all of those things are actually, you can find them in the Atlas too and read a little bit about them and which organizations that are involved. Um, so I think I better stop there. I'm definitely over my five minutes, but I just wanted to thank everyone for being able to, you know, be a part of the journey over the last 20 years of as much as the work, the friendships that have, you know, evolved and the collaborations have really secured the work. So again, thanks to all and uh, thanks to us. Thank you, Andy. So our final panelist is Aida, and perhaps Aida might be uh, part of that new generation that you are looking forward to bringing on board, Andy. Uh, Aida, perhaps you can give us um, a little bit of the government's perspective on how the data and information from the Atlas can be utilized, and also tell us a little bit about your experience um, as a young Omani female working in the field, um, what your job is like, both from the field perspective, as well as um, your efforts behind the desk. Uh, thank you, Saad. Uh, of course, is uh, one of the main objectives of the Environment Authority is the conservation and sustainability of marine environment. So, and uh, as uh, you know, that marine mammals considered as uh, endangered species, uh, as all the communities say, and uh, and uh, also as an indicator uh, of the health of the marine environment. So this kind of uh, studies help decision makers uh, to know the critical areas of uh, breeding and feeding. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, and also uh, to understand the threats they face. Uh, however, we are in uh, connection with this. Uh, we are working together with the experts and uh, researchers to consider the important uh, area of this uh, mammal and for protection and uh, declaration as a natural uh, conserved area and to mitigate uh, the threats as well. And uh, regarding my personal experience, uh, of course, indeed, uh, it's uh, wonderful to, to work with, uh, with this kind of mammals uh, on film. But uh, it's of course, it's uh, to deal with it. Uh, it's uh, not easy. It's uh, difficult uh, to conserve them. As, uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, it's the fishing, uh, uh, which is the most uh, threats they face. Uh, however, my specific work uh, concerned mostly with uh, stranding uh, marine mammals, which I must to deal and contact with the different stakeholders and uh, manage, uh, and uh, most of strandings happen on weekends, and I don't know what the reason behind this. Uh, moreover, this kind of work is not only hard, and uh, we deal with bad smell, uh, it's also emotional uh, work uh, as well, because um, how it's emotional, because you feel heartbroken sometimes when you feel they need your help and you can't do anything. So, for example, in January, I received a call from uh, Dokum Port. It's there is an entangled uh, Arabian humpback whale, which is a unique species. And uh, uh, immediately, I call my uh, I call the experts and my colleagues to to respond. And despite we arrived uh, and uh, try to untangle uh, as much as we can. Uh, but because of the limited time we had, uh, we couldn't fully uh, free the, uh, the whale. And we decided to continue the work to, uh, to the next day. However, it uh, disappeared. And uh, uh, we tried to look for it for a whole day with uh, no use. And uh, till we, uh, we feel that uh, disappointed and return back to the hotel. Surprisingly, and uh, imagine that uh, how the relationship with this mammal, I saw in my dream that uh, they were returned back to the, to the board and uh, only to talk with me and say, thank you, Aida, and uh, no need to look for, uh, for me, I'm free now. Uh, therefore, uh, in the morning, I, uh, I, I told Andy and he feels jealous, that's why I saw in my dream and he's not. 
So, and we decided to return back to Muscat. But of course, with the evidence we get from Coast Guard, and uh, it's uh, and we uh, with the confidence that it's supreme. So, and finally, and uh, there are numerous stories uh, around the world telling how the whale uh, could help the human in the middle of the sea. Uh, therefore, I think we should uh, do the same when they need our hand. And uh, thank you for all the experts and uh, for the wonderful Atlas and for you, Saad. Thank you, Aida. Uh, so thank you all of all of uh, thanks to all of our panelists for joining us for sharing your experience and knowledge with us and thank you to all of our um, audience members.